Good morning, friends. It's so good to have you join us for worship today with Lafayette Baptist Church. As we get ready to begin uh, our service, I want to share with you uh, just really just one announcement here as we um, start. Uh, you know, this past week, uh, actually yesterday, because I'm uh, recording this for you on Thursday, the 25th, um, yesterday we heard from our governor and uh, other leaders in our state uh, regarding uh, the timing of when uh, the state will possibly move into phase three as far as reopening. Uh, I know that we have been pointing toward uh, this announcement for some time and all of us have been very hopeful that uh, perhaps the uh, numbers were going to be such that we as a state uh, could begin to do uh, some regathering uh, that maybe we haven't done uh, to this point. Um, yesterday's news was not what we would have hoped for. Uh, we are going to remain in phase two uh, for another three weeks at least uh, as a state. Uh, also, there was an additional mandate given uh, that is now uh, putting as a mandate what was already being asked of uh, us as citizens of North Carolina that whenever we are in public, uh, that we would wear a face covering or a mask. Um, I know that there are a variety of, of thoughts and feelings uh, on all of this, and a variety of thoughts and feelings about what we should be doing and, and what uh, not only we should be doing as individuals, but what we should be doing collectively uh, as a church uh, regarding regathering. Uh, I'm very aware, and those of us in leadership are very aware, that other congregations have made other choices uh, about uh, gathering together again. Uh, I'm here to say on behalf of the staff, uh, we get it. Uh, we get the desire uh, to be able to be back together. We feel that very strongly as well, uh, but we feel a special burden as well uh, to try and do what we believe is uh, best for us all collectively. Uh, it may not be for best for some of us as individuals. Uh, we get that, but um, we are going to stay stay consistent and stay committed uh, to what we have said all along, that uh, we are going to wait until phase three uh, to begin meeting uh, as a body of believers back in this place and gathering again. There was a video last week uh, put together by the ministers uh, that is available on our YouTube channel as well. And we do hope that you'll watch that because it does speak to when we come back together again, uh, some things that are gonna be different uh, just by necessity in order for us to continue to remain safe. But without addressing a whole lot of that again and going over all of that, I do want to share uh, with you uh, a, a wording from a, an email, uh, actually three different sections of an email uh, that as ministers, we sent out uh, to our uh, church ministry coordinating council um, now several uh, months ago uh, when we first uh, were wrestling with when do we come back and we made the decision at that time that we would not come back until the state had entered into uh, phase three. But I want you to hear these words um, from us uh, related to that, and uh, I hope you'll hear the heart uh, behind this, uh, because this is what we were feeling then, and this is what we still feel now very strongly. It is important to remember when considering whether or not you feel these protocols are warranted 
that we must err on the side of caution. We pray we can all find within ourselves the humility to take the utmost precautions, not for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of others. Our desire to do what we want must come second to our desire to do all we can to protect our brothers and sisters in Christ. The decision to follow any recommended precautions is not a question of freedom. It is a question of love. As we make decisions regarding the church, we do so humbly, prayerfully, and fully aware that we may look back a year from now and see that we should have done something differently. Nothing would please us more than to one day learn that these precautions were unnecessary. We feel so blessed to serve with each of you and we appreciate your love and prayers more than you know. Those words were true when we put them on the email we sent out several months ago to our leaders, and they are still very true today. We hope that you will hear them and receive them as we intend them. We are praying for each of you and will continue to do so in all the days ahead. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, continue to be with us uh, as we worship you each week as we take this time uh, to put together uh, these worship experiences, uh, those of us who are, are doing that, but also as we take the time to participate in worship uh, by watching these, by singing the songs uh, that are uh, shared together as we hear children's sermons and hear scripture read and follow along in our own Bibles. And as we hear the word each week from Cameron uh, that you give to him, uh, I pray, Father, that you will continue to use these things that we share uh, to guide us toward uh, living lives that reflect your presence so that the world may continue to know who you are and come to know who you are and desire to have a relationship with you. We offer this time to you, Father, and offer our lives as well. Uh, be with us and walk with us, Father, and thank you for your goodness to us. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. As we begin worship this day, I ask that you would hear with me or share in your copy of God's Word. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and and forevermore. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of this, his holy word. Let's all sing together, Waymaker.
glad, O people of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten the grape locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. Even, oh, my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens 
and on earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Hi guys, how are you all doing today? I wanted to ask you a question as we started our children's sermon today. Where have you found good in this strange coronavirus time? You may remember that in our very first LBC Kids Zoom meeting, I asked what was the pit and the peak of quarantine. Peak is the highlight, it's all the good stuff. And pit is the low, unfun stuff. We talked about many different things that day. And this question really isn't much different. Where have you found good? You know, I wanted to ask you that question because it was a similar question to something my counselor asked me. My counselor is like a friend who helps me sort through all the things in my head and in my heart. And for the past few months, I've been struggling. The first time she asked me about the good, I think I replied with, uh, uh, I don't really know. Well, she did not like that answer. So she kept asking me, April, where are you finding the good? She really made me think about the good, where I see it, how I feel it, how I share it. And I started to think really hard about that. I started to think about where I have experienced the good. And then as we look forward to today's worship, I began to think about it even more. Psalm chapter 13, verses five and six say this but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. There is good here. Do you know why? Because God is good. He loves us with an unfailing love. He has given us the gift of salvation through Jesus and whether we worship in our homes or at church, whether we work at home or in our offices, whether school returns in August, or if we have more virtual learning to do, God's goodness never changes. When I began talking to my counselor about finding the good, I really started to see it everywhere. Friends who love and support me, the opportunities that I have to connect with you every week, the videos and texts that I receive from you and your families, cards and notes in the mail. We may not be together, but we are still a church family. You all have made that so evident during this time. God is good to us. When the world around us is uncertain, in turmoil, sad or distressed, when things don't go our way, when we mess up and we fall short, when we are missing being together, the Lord has been and continues to be good to us. As we continue with our worship today, I hope you will focus on that. Listen and feel God's goodness in our music, in our prayers, our scripture readings, and our sermon. God is good always. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to continue worshiping together. While we are together and also in our homes, God, we know that you are working all of this for our good. That somewhere in the midst of this chaos, you are busy at work, busy working goodness in our lives, helping us to take part in the good, helping us to seek and grow into your goodness. God, I pray that we will look for the good, that we will trust in your unfailing love, that we will celebrate your salvation, that we will know that your goodness never changes. Thank you, God, for being good to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's all sing together, Goodness of God. Scripture reading from the New Testament today is Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. The parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Let's all 
Let's all sing together, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Good morning, Lafayette Baptist Church. I'm so glad we're together again this morning. Friends, over the time that we've been together, we've seen different kinds of sermons at work because there are a lot of ways that we need to hear God's Word. We've seen that sometimes a sermon is more poetic, where it tries to find just the right word to convey that good and beautiful and true thought that we need to hear. We've seen that some sermons are prophetic. They hit us right between the eyes with some timely truth that perhaps we've forgotten and we need to hear something that might make us squirm. We've also seen that, that some sermons are, are like a deep dive into a difficult concept, some, some idea that we need to carefully inspect and, and internalize so that we can go deeper into our faith. And then there's the good old greasy wrench sermon, the kind of sermon that dispenses with all of the fancy stuff and gets right down to business, addressing some pressing matter that's at hand. Well, there are a lot of ways to preach, but there's one particular sermon type that we perhaps haven't explored a lot together, and that is a story. And you know, it's too bad that we haven't spent as much time just engaging a story together. Because, you know, stories are foundational to our faith. When God wanted to announce the good news of God's own intentions toward us, what did God send? Not a big idea, not a, a textbook. God tells a story. God sends a son. And when the church wants to explain this story and tell it and have it go down through the ages. Again, they didn't try to capture this story in a textbook. They, they just told the story of what God had done. Stories are how the people of faith have attempted to point at something deeper and truer than we could ever point at directly. Stories do something to us. And, and, you know, think about the rest of the New Testament, by the way. We get the story of the early church in the book of Acts. And then the rest of it is basically letters from the apostles to the church. But each of those letters has a backstory, some event that was going on that, that caused the apostle to sit down and write. Stories are 
fundamental to our faith. They are the structure on which our faith is built. And so this morning, the sermon I'd like to share with you is actually more of a story than anything else. So my prayer for us this morning is that we would hear with ears attuned to God's good news tied up in the homey, comfortable package of a story. I hope you'll hear the good news in a different key than we typically sing it. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks that you not only give us big ideas to contend with or, or difficult truths to wrestle with, but you also give us stories. You make plain what is good and true and beautiful by, by telling us something that is good and true, by the things that you've done, by the things that you've done through us. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that in this story, we would hear good news. We would hear your truth proclaimed. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There's something you should probably know about me. There was a time when I considered a career in public radio. In fact, uh, on days when my doctoral dissertation was crawling along at a snail's pace, there were times when I would daydream about perhaps being a contributor to This American Life, or maybe even traveling with Garrison Keillor and his Prairie Home Companion. Ooh, it all sounded so fun to tell stories that kept people on the edge of their seat. It sounded like great fun to me. But you know, my connection to Prairie Home Companion goes even deeper than just the connection to dissertation distraction. In fact, my dad is Norwegian, and he came from a small town in northern Minnesota that bears a strong resemblance to the fictional Lake Wobegon of Garrison Keillor's old stories. <laughs> a visit to Thief River Falls, Minnesota, is about as close as you can get to a visit to that fictional place. So, this morning, in the middle of the dog days of summer, I'd like to share a story that could have happened some crisp autumn day way up north. Join me if you would. It's been a quiet week in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, my father's hometown, out there on the edge of the prairie. There's a chill in the air, and in a matter of days, children will launch their assaults on the neighborhoods, dressed as ghouls and goblins and other frightening creatures like SpongeBob SquarePants. Like their Viking ancestors, these children will pillage the town until they've extracted every last piece of candy, or at least until their war-weary fathers, trailing at an appropriate distance, wave the white flag to signal their surrender. But none of that is on Nils Johnson's mind. Nils, the respected farmer and deacon. I'm a dying breed, he'd tell you. What with the faceless corporate farms and genetically modified seed and machinery so terrible expensive anymore. Then his voice would trail off and he'd shake his head, disgusted to see his way of life disappearing. It's a vulnerable way of life, one that ties you to the land and to nature. It's a, a way of life that requires faith, or at the very least, thick skin. Some years, everything could be going right when suddenly, wham, disaster strikes, and that's just the way it is. You've got to accept it. Nils was a good man. He supported his farming habit by plumbing, taking out-of-town assignments for a week or so here and there. And because people knew this, when he was not out of town or in his field, he was often under someone else's sink, unplugging a pipe, and refusing payment. He did not have a sunny disposition, but he was no sourpuss. He was an emphatic realist. Once when his wife read a book on the power of positive thinking, she scolded him saying, come now, every cloud has a silver lining. 
To which he replied, Yeah, but it's still a cloud, you know. But on this morning, he was preoccupied by good news from the farm market report that he just heard on the radio. The price of wheat had reached a record high. Never had been demand been so strong, and this year farmers who planted wheat stood to win big if they could get their crop in. Nils hunched over his bowl of Cheerios and his Folgers, and he was chewing thoughtfully. Wheat? Who knew? After a couple of years of soybeans, this year he went for wheat for no particular reason, and now he had a bumper crop waiting to be harvested. Three years ago was the last time he broke even. Two years ago, hail devastated his crop. Last year, it started raining a week before harvest and didn't stop for four days. With water standing in the field, he couldn't run his machinery, and it left him to watch his crops rot from a distance, only to plow it under and hope for better next time. He crunched the numbers in his head. If he could get the whole crop in, he could stand to not only get caught up with the bank, but even to put some money away for the not-too-distant future when he wouldn't be able to farm anymore. This was still on his mind as he and his wife, Danae, drove to church. She said to him, We have a guest preacher today, you know. He let out a sigh. Pastor Dahlquist claimed that it was his goal to train up another generation of preachers. But Nils wondered if he just liked an extra week off every now and again. These training exercises had not always gone so well. Not long ago, the guest preacher was the pastor's 16-year-old grandson who was visiting from out of town, and he unleashed an hour-long tirade on the text, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. It was 16-year wisdom, right at its best. Not deterred by Nils's lack of enthusiasm, Danae continued, well, I think it's going to be nice. Pastor Dahlquist's grandson is preaching. Well, I suppose this time he'll talk to you about how you're supposed to keep silent in church then. No, no, not that one, she said. This is the grandson that's been in seminary. She said seminary with a reverent tone not quite shared by Nils. Oh, good. A sermon straight out at a cemetery. He was pleased with his pun, but Danae shot him an icy glance to make clear that that was the end of that conversation. Not much was different in church that week, other than the new face beaming next to Pastor Dahlquist on the platform. Once the hymns had been sung, the pastor shuffled up to the pulpit. Oozing pride, he introduced his grandson, Brad, explaining that he had come to the Twin Cities for a conference but was making a special trip this week and next all the way up to Thief River just to preach. A tear came to his eyes. He spoke of watching his grandson mature into such a fine young man, the first of his family full of preachers to go to seminary. And despite all that schooling, he still loved the Lord anyway. Brad stepped up to the pulpit, and Nils folded his arms across his chest and listened with one eyebrow arched, the same listening pose he adopted for meetings at the city council or the school board. The young preacher read his text from Joel chapter 2. Be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has poured down on you abundant rain, the early rain and the later rain, as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. The sermon was packed with history. Clearly, Brad had read the commentaries. But it sounded as if he was reading directly from the commentaries in the pulpit. There was talk of Hebrew verbs and participles and archaeological insights and a lengthy digression about the life cycle of locusts. Meanwhile... Nils's attention drifted toward his farm. He thought of the years of struggle, the years where no rain would fall and the land lay dead and cracked, followed by years where there were bucketfuls of rain at just the wrong time. He wondered to himself, where do you suppose God is in all of that? 
But he pushed the thought aside, returning quickly to his credo. That's just the way it goes. Some years are good, some years are bad. You just press on. That's all you can do, right? The sermon, well, it wound down with a fizzle. Nils shot a glance around the church and saw every other farmer in the place tapping their toes, antsy to get back home and tend to business. And as soon as they got in the car, Nils said to Danae, Well, he's not outstanding in his field, but he made all of us wish that we were. She replied coolly, I think he did a lovely job. He's so intelligent. I think it's refreshing. Nils figured he should keep the rest of his observations to himself. He raced home, even though there was no way Danae would stand for him to work on the Sabbath. After inhaling lunch, he went out to the field and took a look. Everything was perfect. Heavy heads of grain sat atop the beautiful golden stalks, rippling in the breeze like waves on a pond. He stole a glance at the sky above, looking for a sign. There were no clouds. He sniffed and smelled nothing but crisp autumn air and a distant fireplace. He set his jaw, marched to the barn, climbed into the John Deere combine, and cranked up the engine. He heard the familiar chugging purr. Then he grasped the steering wheel and said aloud to his tractor, This week, this week we clear a field. He felt a steely resolve grow in him as if he were headed into battle, and he set off for the house to plan the week. He awoke early Monday. He was a man on a mission. He reheated what was left of yesterday's pot of coffee and poured it into his thermos, grabbing one of those Nutrigrain bars that Danae was forever after him to try. This morning, he didn't care that it tasted like dirt with a little jelly mixed in. He had to get out to his field. He figured that he could clear his 200 acres by the weekend, but there was not a moment to lose. He fired up the combine and eased her out into the field. She ran like silk, and it thrilled him to lower the header and hear the blades swishing through the wheat. As he rounded the first corner, he heard a heavy kerchunk and the sickening sound of twisting metal. In the early dawn light, he did not realize that he had lowered the blades too far, and he hit a big rock, one of the infernal rocks that were forever being spit up out of the cold, dark soil. He climbed down to assess the damage and saw that he had really torn it up. Nils went into town to the John Deere dealer to buy the parts he needed, and, of course, they did not have it in stock. So he drove to Grand Forks, North Dakota, an hour away. By the time he returned home, there was little daylight left. He worked as long as he could before throwing in the towel and trudging back home. Tuesday, he made as heroic an attempt as Monday. By that evening, he had finally repaired the mangled blades, and the combine was now in working order, but he had lost two days of harvesting, and now he was getting nervous. Nils was not a man given to much fidgeting, but for the rest of the night, he paced the floor, and when he got into bed, he tossed and turned. The next morning, as soon as there was light enough to see what he was doing, he was out in the field, hard at work. He ran the combine around the field, being quick and thorough. There was fire in his eyes as he rounded the corners expertly, not missing a stalk of wheat. A normal day of harvesting meant four trips to the grain bin, and today he completed his first load an hour ahead of schedule. He pulled the combine alongside his truck, and with the flip of a switch, wheat poured out of the hopper and into the trailer. Soon he was ready to transport his first load. He roared across the field toward the bin with a knot of excitement in the pit of his stomach. He was going to make it after all. He pulled close and hooked up the auger, which would spit his wheat up into the granary. But when he flipped the switch, nothing happened. The auger wasn't auging. It wouldn't aug. Nils scrambled, checking fuses and breakers and searching the control box for loose wires. Running back toward the truck, Nils felt his ankle give way under him, and he lurched forward. And there he lay, face down in the dirt. He clutched his ankle and said, What on earth? Looking around to see what he tripped on. It was a gopher hole. 
Upon closer inspection, he realized that this gopher had not only caused him to twist his ankle, but it had chewed up the electrical cord that he had buried, the electrical cord powering the auger. Now, Nils was not a man prone to strong language, but this tested his mettle. He hobbled and fumed and shook his fist, and right about then, he remembered the smart aleck know-it-all seminarian who preached last Sunday. All that talk about God repaying what the grasshopper had stolen. He couldn't shout at God with a clear conscience, but he could sure let the preacher have it. So he yelled to anyone who'd listen, So, there is a locust subsidy, eh? Well, you suppose there's a gopher policy too? And tell me, wise guy, if you know so much about farm life, what do you do with a chewed up electrical wire when you've got a crop in the field that's got to come in right now? He had gotten it off his chest, but he didn't feel any better. Even though there was no one there to hear it, he felt sort of bad. He was finally able to rig up the auger to an extension cord, and now it began to spit grain into the bin. Despite the delay, Nils managed to get full, four full loads in that day. But he couldn't shake that unsettled feeling, having chewed out the preacher that wasn't there. Thursday, he was up early, this time with renewed resolve. He took time for a bowl of cereal and a fresh pot of coffee, thinking, well, there's no use in jinxing a perfectly good day with a Nutri-Grain bar. And he listened to the farm market report, and the announcer said, Major shortfalls in European production have sent the price of wheat even higher. France is mandating that farmers begin to produce more wheat to support regional demand. Times have never been so good for American wheat. Nils's pulse quickened a bit. The thought of having a bumper crop of the most valuable grain on the market while getting to stick it to the French? It was almost more good news than he could take. The announcer continued, Unfortunately, the news is not all good. A major storm front is headed our way. If you have crops in the field, you'd better act quick. A Cheerio ne nearly went down the wrong pipe. Neil sputtered and pulled on his coat as quickly as he could, sprinting to the barn. All day long he worked his heart out. And much to his surprise, nothing went wrong. He managed to pull in five loads, a full load more than usual and he was beginning to see real progress. And so far, there was no rain. It was dark when he walked back to the house, but with a flashlight in hand, he took a detour through his field, wading through the waist-high wheat, the most beautiful crop of his life. He let his fingers run through the ripe heads of grain, and he was nearly overcome with the sense of gratitude. But he stopped himself saying, don't count your chickens just yet. Still plenty of harvest to go and rain on the way. There will be time enough for celebrating. So he furrowed his brow and purposefully walked back home. Friday, he worked like a man possessed. He raced through the field, to the trailer, to the grain bin, and back again. All the while, he kept one eye on the thick clouds that were now gathering overhead, muttering threats at them, all but daring them to break open somehow they didn't. In the face of great peril, Nils had accomplished a heroic feat. That day, single-handedly, he harvested more grain than he had in his entire life, six full loads. He was now a day's work from finishing the field, and he allowed himself a brief celebration, which amounted to a self-satisfied grin followed by a smirk directed at the clouds up above. The next morning, he awoke with a look of solemn determination, and he donned his baseball cap, stained with sweat and field dust. Even if the rains came and the field grew soupy, he planned to arm himself with a sickle like the Grim Reaper and take that grain down by hand like they did back in the old country. Nothing was going to stop him today. And nothing did. The work was fairly easy. He managed to clear the rest of the field in three loads, wrapping up by one o'clock. After the last of the grain had been deposited in the granary, which was now full, nearly to overflowing, Nils took a deep breath, exhausted by the week's exploits. 
And then he started to laugh. It was the dark laughter of one who had cheated fate. Through hard work and determination, he cleared that field without losing a stock. When he walked in the house, he found Danae already working on supper. Never mind with all of that. Tonight I am taking you out to eat. He walked to her, planted a big playful kiss on her forehead, and then headed off to the shower. Danae was shocked. What in the world was that for? And since when do we eat out? At the restaurant, Nils didn't even look at the prices on the menu. Instead, he found the largest steak listed and announced to Danae, I'm going to have the porterhouse. What would you like? Get anything you want. These are words she had never heard cross his lips. Cautiously, she said, Well, then, uh, I think I'll have the veal parmesan. Veal parmesan, he thought. Since when did she take a liking to Italian food? Does she even know what that is? His first instinct was to say, My, aren't we getting fancy? But then he caught himself. And instead he took her hand and said, That sounds good. I hope you'll let me have a bite. But before long, conversation turned to how the money would be spent, what bills would be paid, and what would be socked away for retirement. The celebration was nearly over before it started, and a cloud of anxiety descended on the table. They decided to skip dessert and drove home in silence. With nothing left to do, they went to bed early. The next morning on the way to church, Danae reminded Nils that Brad, Pastor Dahlquist's grandson, would be preaching again. Oh, good, he said. Perhaps this week I'll learn more about the locusts, or maybe what color uniforms the Babylonians wore. But he was in for a surprise. During the hymn singing, Nils looked up on the platform. The young man at the pastor's side somehow seemed different. It was Brad, all right, but this morning he was not beaming with confidence. He was visibly shaken. After the hymns, Pastor Dahlquist announced again his grandson. But this time there was no mention of seminary or his grandson's brilliance. He simply welcomed him to share what the Lord had laid on his heart. Brad stepped into the pulpit, pale and trembling. He began by saying, I I have to say, I, I think I have no business being up here. Nils thought to himself, Well, the kid's off to a pretty good start. Brad continued, You see, last week I had a realization. Preaching's a lot harder than I thought it was. It's not about regurgitating a Bible commentary, and, and it's not about being positive or motivational. And, and I have to confess to you, I, I don't really know what I'm doing, but... But this week I came across a passage that, that just seemed like it needed to be heard. He read Jesus' parable of the persistent widow, the story of the little old lady who had been treated unjustly, who would not give up complaining to a judge, a judge she knew to be a bad man, until he relented. Brad admitted it was an odd story, a little confusing even. But he pointed out that unlike most parables, Luke actually tells us how to read this one when it says this, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Nils uncrossed his arms and looked over at Danae's Bible. Well, he thought, I hadn't noticed that before. Brad suggested that we completely miss the point if we conclude that God is uncaring like the unjust judge, or if we think that the moral of the story is that we need to wear God out before he'll answer a prayer. He said the point is really simple. Pray. Don't give up. Pray. Remember that we are a dependent people. Pray. No matter how hard we work, at the end of the day, it's all about God's grace. Pray. Nils shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Brad went on preaching, now with a bit of color in his cheeks. He said, you know, I've noticed something as I've been visiting my grandpa up here ever since I was a kid. Over the years, 
I've noticed that we up here are a stoic people. We, we like to leave it all just to fate. We're pious, we read the Bible, and we, we pray some. But if we don't watch it, we run the risk of resigning ourselves to fate, just saying, well, that's the way it goes. But if we resign ourselves like that, we might keep praying because we ought to. But then again, we might stop praying altogether, at least real praying, dependent praying. And, and you know what's really bad for us Stoics? We can't celebrate. Not really. There can be no real festivity because there's no real grace. There can be no thanksgiving because there's no sense of God's blessing. There's just good times and bad. Some days you're the pigeon, some days you're the statue. When we live like there's no hope, we lose faith and love, too. We Stoics are on the doorstep of despair, and we don't even know it. That's why when Jesus finishes his parable, he wraps it up by saying, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It's a good question, friends. Will he find faith in us? Will we be Stoics, or will we be Christians? And with that, Brad wrapped up his sermon and sat down. The piano player, sensing a holy moment of decision, began to play. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Calling for you and for me. Come home. Come home. You who are weary, come home. Brad had no idea how to do an invitation. So his grandfather came up to the pulpit with a quiver in his voice and said, We have heard from God today. If you need to pray, really pray. Or if you need to repent, as I do, come come. As a stalwart member of the church, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, Nils had not been down to the altar in many years. He figured that he went so often as a kid that surely one of those took. But this was a different kind of decision. He realized that he really didn't pray much anymore. Not really. He was trying to pull himself up by his own bootstraps, but, but now he wasn't so sure he was even wearing boots. This week he had been blessed beyond measure, but he nearly missed it. He nearly didn't say thanks. So there at the altar with several others, he prayed. When they made it back to their seats, Pastor Dahlquist reminded the congregation that it was Communion Sunday. He called the deacons forward, Nils and all the rest. And they took the brass trays and distributed the little crackers and the little plastic cups of Welch's grape juice to the congregation while they sang, Great is thy faithfulness. Nils went and sat by his wife, overcome by gratitude. Pastor Dahlquist said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And they did. His words were nearly drowned out by the storm that had finally broken overhead, pelting the church roof with heavy drops, softening the furrows of the field, and making all things new. Let's all sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness, beginning to end.
Friends, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord surprise you by the goodness of his grace. And may you pray. Pray with gladness, with grateful hearts, with persistence, this day and always. Amen.